Hi folks. So this hopefully very short video um, is going to just be a quick description of what user accounts are, why they're important uh, for cyber security, um, and how they work on Linux in some detail and uh, briefly on Windows. So user accounts are important because once you've logged into a system and like you've already authenticated, your identity that's used to actually make a lot of the important security decisions um, is based on the user account that you that you're using. So um, the the fundamental idea is that you can have more than one user on a computer system and that they can have different things that they're allowed to do or different things that the behavior is different depending on who it is that's using the system. So Obviously, it doesn't do much if you don't actually log in with separate user accounts. <clears throat> so if you've got a shared computer, uh, say in an office, um, the best practice would be to give everyone that uses that computer a separate user account with a separate password, uh, rather than just, for example, tell everyone the password to one account. Um, but the way it works in, in Linux is that there's a, a number, so 32-bit integer, so a whole number, um, that just represents what user it is on the system, and that's known as the user ID. Um, and each account, um, so each UID, can actually have more um, usernames. So you could have, if you had two user names that had the same account number, same UID, then they are actually uh, the same user. So there's just one user account, um, but you had two different, like, um, but generally it's a bad idea, but it is te technically possible. Um, uh, you might get some software that um, has <clears throat> unexpected results if you do do that, but it, it's, it's possible. Um, usernames have to be unique, and um, Depending on what version of Linux you're using, for example, you, there might be different rules about how long the username is allowed to be. But originally, it was limited to eight, like alphanumerical characters. Um, and basically, the username is like the name that you have associated with an account. So, if I wanted an account and I called it Cliff, for example, so that I've, you know, that's my name, so I would use that as an account name potentially. Um, it just makes it easier for me than if I have to remember that my UID on this computer is 1001 and then on another computer it might actually be 1010. Um, so the user name is just to make it easier for all the humans involved to understand what's going on. Um, so the user name is just a way of saying who you are. So, you know, identify, so, uh, yeah, I'm Cliff, for example, and then. Um, the authentication kind of comes next. That's my identification is saying this is me, and then when it prompts for the password and I type that in, then that's me authenticating. Um, and so groups work in a similar way. So you've got a group on Linux has a name, a group name, and a group ID or GID. Um, and on a Unix system or a Linux system, uh, you typically you're a member of at least one group because when where your user is like defined, you will have a primary group that's specified, and then you also have other groups that you can be members of um, as well. So the in terms of actual, on, a, on an actual Linux system, the information about user accounts is stored in the etc slash password file, um, and um, typically all users can read that, so there's a list of all the users that are on the system. Uh, and all the users can see that, um, and it contains the username, um, password with an asterisk, because a UID, primary group, full name, home directory, shell, um, and you know some other stuff. But this, um, the password is not actually stored anymore in the etc password file because it is like readable to everyone uh, by design. Uh, they've moved that now. Um, and we'll talk about that later. And groups are defined in the etc group file. So I guess let's just have a quick look at that. So, um, well, so we don't even need to use sudo. I can just cat 
the password file as a normal user. Um, and I can see this is the contents of the, the password file. This is where users are actually defined. So I've got you know, my username that I'm logged in with it here. And there's an X, so that's the password. There's the UID, so that's the user identity um, for, for this user account, so that's 1001. There's a group ID, which happens to also be 1001. Um, there is a, so that's the primary group that I'm a member of. And then there's um, <clears throat> the um, like ad additional information. There's the home directory of the user and the actual um, uh, shell so that when I log in, bash is the sh my default shell. So when I log into a system, I get the bash. It's like the, uh, this command line um, interactive shell. Um, so, and then it, so that's where users are specified. You can see the password field just has an X in it and that means it's been shadowed, so it's stored elsewhere. Uh, we can also look at the, um, the, the group file and that specifies um, the group along with any users that are members of it, but these are the secondary ones. So this doesn't include anyone or everyone's primary groups. So in order to really understand what's going on, you have to look at both here and in the, um, the, the password file. But you can see here, for example, there's a group um, that has multiple members. Uh, and if I look uh, here, um, let's see if I can find a good example. So there's the audio group here. And there's the Vagrant and the Pulse user are both like members of that group. Neither of them have them as a primary group, but when they log in, they'll also be members of the audio group. You can see here, it's defined my group here. Um, and again, there's a group password that's shadowed, uh, or can be shadowed, but there's a group ID. And then um, there's no one that's listed here. But if I look at my own identity, um, I can see that I am a member of that group because it's my primary group that was listed in the password file. Um, so looking at um, like this information, uh, there's the who am I and the groups um, command. So who am I just gives me my username. Groups gives me a list of groups that I'm a member of, and this ID command gives me all that information with some more detail. And there's various um, flags that you can use to get different levels of detail out of that, but you get the idea. So there's also, uh, you know, as you're um, no doubt aware, there's a root user, which is like a super user <clears throat> on a Unix system, which has a UID of zero, um, and, and it's treated differently to everyone else. Uh, by the kernel and everything. So the same rules that apply to everyone else, don't they apply differently if your UID has this special value of zero. So if we, um, uh, oops, if we, let me get this back. Uh, so if we here type in, um, go back to looking at the uh, user accounts, we can see here there's a root account um, and it's UID is zero, group ID is zero, um, and its home directory is in um, slash root, whereas all the other users, normal users' home directories, are normally in slash home slash their username, usually, but it can be anything, but that's the norm. Um, and uh, but so yeah, root's um, home directory is in a different place. So if you look at browsing the um, the file system. Um, as a normal user, I won't have. Actually, I'll do it. I'll do it by the command prompt because uh, by the shell because I won't have permission. Um, if I list here, I can see these are the the um, directories in the root of the file system. There's the home. Um, which is where you'll find uh, all of these normal user accounts and if we look in root and this is the one I won't norm wouldn't normally have permission to look in um, you can see that this this is the home directory of the root user and there's there's not a lot there um, in this case 
so well, not it's bad it's um, it's bad practice to actually log in as root if you can avoid it. So it's better to use sudo and give someone permission to run like I just did there, where I'm running as a normal user and then I can use sudo and there are rules that govern the fact that I can sudo and run commands as root. So in this case, when I run this command, it runs it as root, um, but it's um, based on. But otherwise, I'm running as my normal user. I can actually change user into the root uh, user, um, like so. Uh, and now I'm actually have a root shell. So now I can, uh, well, now if I print my working directory, my home directory is root, and that's where I've started. Um, but it's actually bad practice to log in as root. It's much better to stay uh, logged in as a normal user that has sudo access and you can run your commands as sudo when you need to do root-like things. Because otherwise, um, well, there's quite a few reasons, but one is accidental um, data loss, that like you might make a mistake. They could delete all the files on the system. Like You shouldn't be running with that level of privilege unless you need to, so you, you, you selectively t say when you need to act as root rather than doing it all the time. Um, so, um, and generally you should never log in as the, into a graphical desktop as root for the exact same reasons. So, um, generally speaking, you can think of um, Linux user accounts as being like normal accounts, so that's usually everything above 1000. There's the root account, which is zero, and then there's the synthetic user accounts, because a lot of services actually basically just create, run as their own users. So um, they're treated like the same way that users are treated, um, and that's because um, that, you know, look, let's have a look. Um, so if we look at the yeah, again, at the password file, we can see all of these things here are um, user accounts that aren't actual users, um, like all of these. Um, so, um, you know, you can even have a, an account that you run your games under so that, you know, um, if there was like a security problem, then it, the, the games can't access your files, for example. Uh, and you've got, um, you know, a separate um, username that you have your um, like website data that you're hosting on a web server, as and you know and so on. So you, you know you might have an IRC server, for example, and you would you could it could have its own user account. So these are known as synthetic accounts, and it's kind of a workaround because for a long time Linux and Unix didn't have any like of the more advanced features that we have today. So that there are various, there's lots of different ways actually that you can achieve running different programs with different sets of privileges and we'll cover it later in a separate topic. Um, but, you know, because historically there was no other way to do it um, and it's kind of easy for people to understand, you have these user accounts. And actually, um, side note is that on, on um, Android, Actually, the way the whole sandboxing thing works is every application on an Android device has a separate UID, separate user, Linux user account. Um, but again, that's a topic for another day. So, going back to the slides. Um, so yeah, when every time a process starts, when you start a program, uh, it gets associated with a user account, and that UID is used to make the security decisions for that program to see what it's allowed to do. And so it's really important that programs actually are running with a correct UID, and that's obviously why we have authentication. Um, on Windows systems, it's quite similar, uh, but it's a security ID number, so an SID, and it looks something like this, so it's a lot more complicated. Um, so rather than being a single number, uh, it also has a bunch of other information. Um, so that S specifies it's an SID, there's a revision number, there's an um, identifier authority, sub-authority, sub-authority, etc. Basically, you have um, the domain that the user account has been created for baked into the UID. So if you have, um, and we'll get into Active Directory and things again in a separate topic, but I guess the thing to understand is that on a, on a Windows system, 
Uh, the ID uh, includes the domain that they're a member of. Um, uh, but other than that, it's still just essentially a number. Uh, and this last part is like the, you know, the, the, the number, I guess, that if you want to just look at the number at the end, that um, represents the user. And there are actually, um, if you follow the link, there's a bunch of well-known numbers that are used for different services. Why not? We'll have a quick look. So you can see here that there are um, there are specific SIDs that refer to specific groups of people or people, um, and there are um, let me show you an, um, some important ones. There is um, there's like guest accounts will end in specific like numbers and. Um, you can see that like admin accounts uh, will have a specific um, yeah, number as well. So that, so that there are um, an administrators. So there's a specific, um, oh, that's, so that's the administrator group. So there are specific um, kind of hard coded uh, like patterns or numbers that um, are used to represent specific uh, users. Um, on a Windows system, and you know you can browse this list at your at your own leisure. There's there's quite a lot of them. I can actually get back to my slides. Um, and so, and on a on a um, on a Windows system, you can use the whoami command um, with the user flag to um, you know get that information out. So, in conclusion, um, what happens on a Linux system is you identify as yourself, and then the verif and then you, then you authenticate, um, and the and then on a Linux system, we've just discussed the technical details about how that's actually implemented. And uh, the subject of where the password is stored will be in a separate video about passwords. <laughs>